Uh, my name is Jacob Wren. Uh, I'm the author of the novel uh, Polyamorous Love Song. Uh, it's a book about artists and ethics and what might or might not become possible. Yeah, my idea with a polyamorous love song is I, I was thinking about uh, listening to the radio and how uh, all the love songs on the radio are, are love songs to one person, to one love, one great love or soulmate. And I was just thinking, how would our world be different if all of the love songs on the radio were polyamorous love songs and they were all about having many loves? And how uh, would that change uh, our idea of love? And this was very much a question about what art can do, like uh, if we say the pop songs on the radio are art, which is arguable and, and maybe they're only corporate products, but, but I mean, I think pop music is art or pop music is art for me. And you know, you really think of how many songs you've heard that talk about love in the same way and, and how that shapes your idea of what love is and isn't. And this is very much about how art shapes our world and how artistic works uh, create the foundation for what we think life is, for what we think love should be, for what we think work should be, for what we think art should be. And, and these foundations have, a, have an enormous effect on, on our thinking. So it's just a, a question. Uh, if all the songs on the radio were different, would the world be different? I mean, I think it's so personal. I mean, I'm kind of like a you know, an isolated, alienated, lone wolf who, who dreams of community. And, and you can really feel this in my writing. You can really feel uh, uh, how hard uh, I find it to be part of a community, how hard I find it to work in a community. And also you, you can really feel my, my overwhelming desire to do so and, and my belief in, in the value of people working together and of a kind of a living, working connection uh, between not just like two people, but between lots of people. And I think this is, you know, uh, uh, this is the struggle, uh, you know, uh, how much to be alone and, and how much to to work with people, how much to be alone and, and how much to to find the connections that are possible and, and what connections are possible and, and where do you find them. And yes, I mean, everyone in the novel is uh, is looking for ways to, to do things together. I mean, I, I think life is always connected to performance. So I think, I mean, we behave different ways in, in different situations. Uh, you know, you behave one way at a job interview and another way on a first date. Uh, though first dates maybe are becoming a little bit more like <laughs> job interviews, so that space is closing a little. But, I mean, when you're writing a book, you're also thinking, I, I'm a person writing a book. And how do I approach uh, this activity? And, and what kind of uh, what perf kind of performance am I doing uh, writing a book? Uh, what I know is I, I don't want to uh, create a seamless surface of fiction that is trying to be a real world, and that is a self-contained real world you're supposed to believe in. In fact, I want the exact opposite. Uh, I want the reader to know that I'm writing this book. I want the reader to feel the cracks of the fiction and to feel uh, to, to see that I'm showing through these cracks. I want the the artifice of the story uh, to oscillate between having a kind of reality and being only a, a set of questions and a set of ideas and for my presence to be felt in the book as someone who's uh, experiencing this oscillation myself as I'm writing it. Uh, as I'm writing, sometimes the book becomes more real for me and at other times it becomes something I, I'm just making up as I go. And my writing is always a kind of structured Im improvisation. I have a kind of uh, some ideas that, that we might call a structure or a form. And around this, I, I'm trying to improvise. I'm trying to surprise myself. I'm trying to put myself off balance. So uh, wh whatever it is, this, this uh, performance I'm giving a as a writer, uh, I want it to be there. I want it to be felt, and, and I want people to, to see me doing it. I don't want to hide behind anything. Yeah, I mean, I think it, uh, at its heart, it comes from a kind of loneliness in art and, and in life, and a feeling that uh, uh, a kind of, um, 
you know, when I go see a, a work of art or go see a performance or read a book, uh, I really don't want to feel empty. And so much art does make me feel empty. And I think uh, one of the reasons is because uh, it's like uh, art that's being made as if the rest of the world isn't there. So, uh, I mean, some of like the formalist or modernist concerns were an extreme example of that, like a, a canvas painted gray would be an extreme example of, of trying to make art as if the rest of the world didn't exist. And for me, uh, this gives me a very empty feeling, even though I, I can see what, what might be interesting about it uh, for the people who made it at that time. And I'm really looking uh, for the opposite of that, for, for an art that lets in as much of the world as possible, that lets in as much of politics, as much as daily human life, as much of thinking. And, and th the idea that uh, the more of the world that exists around us, the, the more supported we feel and, and maybe the less lonely we might feel. I mean, I'm really, I don't totally understand, like, uh, why it's so hard to write a manifesto today or, or why it's so difficult to form an art movement. And, and you read about the history of uh, modern art with Dada and surrealism and constructivism, and you felt that uh, these artists uh, really wanted to work together to change something and, and really felt a sense of conviction around what they were doing. Uh, that, that's quite hard to find today or that seems to be hard to find today. And uh, I mean, in fiction, you can do things that are difficult to do in life. Uh, I mean, I've worked in collectives all my life. I, I know how difficult it is to get people to work together and, and to push in the same direction. And uh, I mean, uh, as everyone knows, I have a kind of practice where I make performances and where I make collective performances. And in my literature and my books, I, I can do so many things that, that I can't do in life. So uh, there's a sense that uh, I can b both have this conviction and these kind of art movements that, that I've made up, basically, uh, in literature in, in a way that, that I haven't found a way to do yet in life. But, I mean, at the same time, I, I hope I will. I don't know, that there's a joke, projects are the new isms. And, uh, I mean, very much to... Uh, the way art is structured now is around projects, like a project it has a finite beginning and end and it you work on it for this amount of time. Uh, well, isms were uh, something that you were supposed to, you know, was supposed to last forever. And, and I do think we have a very truncated sense of time now uh, because of environmental problems. We're not sure there'll be a future. Or we're, not, we're not sure there'll be a future in the same sense they were excited about the future in the past. And I do also think like... Um, I do think all of the isms of the early 20th century had some connection to fascism and to socialism and to political social movements that wanted to change the world or, or take over or change the future. And uh, those political projects have collapsed, or at least the, the, that way of, uh, of pronouncing themselves has collapsed. So, uh, and also the fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of cap uh, communism. I wanted to say the fall of capitalism, which is my dream. Uh, it has given us a sense that, uh, as, as Mark Fisher writes in Capitalist Realism, uh, he defines capitalist realism as the idea that capitalism is the only possible system and no other system could work. And I think that an ism is based on the fact that there's another way of doing things, which is what I still believe. They're, the way things are is one way things could be, and, and they could be so many other ways, if only, uh, if only you try. I feel like a word that's used to describe such a vast number of different things uh, maybe becomes meaningless. But I also think, uh, I mean, the word art is like saying we, like, um, like in political discourse, like when you go to political meetings, there's always someone who says, you know, we want to do this. And then there's always someone else who says, what do you mean by saying we, who are you referring to? There's lots of different interests here. There's lots of different opinions. But this saying we has a kind of, you know, power, like it's about the possibility of what if we all got together and pushed in the same direction, what could happen? And I think the word art is also, you know, a word that suggests, you know, what might happen, what might, uh, what might exist uh, if we kind of open, open the boundaries of imagination around making things. 
And I think, you know, you could say like, you know, the art of cooking or, you know, there's like, art also has to do with a certain care and attention you give to what you're doing. And when this care and attention kind of produces uh, results, uh, an opening of results or a different way of, a different way of thinking about a problem or a question. So I do think uh, the meaningless of the word art also, or the, is a kind of openness that also shows what its potential is or, or what its energy might be. I don't know. I mean, the book just came out uh, and, uh, you know, you, you have a dream that uh, uh, you, you write a book and, and people are going to like grab it and as they're reading it, tear off their clothes and run naked through the street, holding it up and demanding that everyone else read it immediately. and. Uh, maybe that's not the best dream to have. <laughs> and what does a book do in the world? I mean, uh, I think a lot about, like, I don't know what age I was, or in my early 20s, seeing Twin Peaks on television, uh, David Lynch's series Twin Peaks, and thinking, oh my god, this is on television. I can't believe something this strange is on television. I can't believe this is possible on television. And, you know, that was a moment uh, that I feel is closed off a little bit and more and more things that have a, more and more works that have a different view of the world are, are marginalized and I feel the mainstream has somehow gotten more mainstream in my lifetime, which, which doesn't mean it can shift back again. So when, so when I think about what my book can do in the world, I, I think it's, uh, I mean, I can't help but thinking, uh, you know, my position is so marginal that it can, can't affect very much. And yet in that feeling that my position is marginal, there's, you know, the hope that uh, anything can happen. I had never seen so many people crammed into the house. In fact, there was barely room for all of us. Video monitors and cameras had been set up in every corner. You could participate in this meeting from any room. I recognized the mascots and productive compromisers. I think basically all of us were there, but there were so many others I'd never seen before. Every kind of person, businessmen, street punks, religious sects, people from other parts of the world in traditional dress. I felt ignorant, not knowing precisely what parts of the world they were from. So many characters, kinds of characters, I was unable to place or identify. It seemed the mascots really got around. They had managed to draw together an entire spectrum of the unexpected. Melanie and I pushed through the crowd, gradually shoving our way from room to room with no particular purpose. No one seemed to know when the meeting would start or what it was about. There was much curiosity and speculation. Steve was in a corner watching the action with a strange expression, far removed from his usual anxious bemusement. Who the fuck are all these people? I shrugged and smiled. They're the International Worldwide Mascot Super Fan Club, Melanie said, scanning the room for potential conquests. I took a moment to admire how, even at the heart of a political meeting, she could continue to cruise. Maybe our gang should get out there a bit more, go forth in the world, get organized, Steve continued, scanning the room, trying to make sense of it all. It's like we're the local burger joint and they're fucking McDonald's. It's also true I, I felt a strange kind of jealousy. They say sex sells, but it now seemed the unlikely combination of guns plus furry outfits was selling much better. In every room, there was such a palpable sense of excitement. I, I felt that, like us, most of the people here had assumed they were the only ones who knew about the mascots, who were in on the secret. Everyone just as surprised as us to learn there were so many supporters. We spotted Samantha on the far side of the room. She didn't see us and was gone before we made it over. The epicenter of the meeting appeared to be in the basement, surrounding the famous artist still chained to the radiator. On all monitors, one could see a large group of mascots, most in outfit but a handful not, sitting in a semicircle whose open side faced the radiator. Microphones were being set up. Nothing seemed forced, but everything contributed to a perpetual build in anticipation. From what we knew and could see, the mascots had never had a leader. Power seemed to continuously shift among them, within smaller or larger groups that operated autonomously. There may have well been some functional structure behind it, but 
if so it remained invisible. Then, very suddenly, a loud bell rang ten times. A microphone was handed to the famous artist. His voice sounded clearly in every room. I have been asked to chair this meeting. I, I suppose I was asked because I'm thought to be a bit neutral, not exactly a mascot, something of an outsider. However, as many of you already know, I do not consider myself neutral in any way. From my perspective, I am a complete and total partisan of the mascot front and their ongoing battle. But perhaps that is be beside the point. The mascot front have called this meeting because, for the first time ever, they now wish for others to fight alongside them. The only way against failure and towards success is solidarity. In the past, the mascot front has attempted to do no damage to anyone other than those who are directly attacking them, like the Hippocratic Oath, first rule, do no harm. But now the situation has become considerably more dire. And if anyone here chooses to fight alongside us in the future, it is possible, even likely, that you might be injured or killed. This is the shift, the possible change in our policy, that we have come together to, to question and discuss. In one sense, it is true what we're looking for here tonight are, are volunteers. Volunteers to fight by our side, volunteers to help us survive. But in another sense, we are searching for something more. We feel ready to open up, to question the basic assumptions of our strategy, which we now must admit is failing us. We are here to ask all of you to think about the question together. How can we still win? There was a pause as the microphone was handed to Bear. A meeting like this is a strange beast, Bear continued. All of you know something about the mascot front, but few of you know very much. This has, perhaps, up until now, been our fatal flaw. The fact that almost no one knows just how bad things have gotten, that we now believe we are practically on the verge of extinction, also prevents anyone from offering assistance. Of the 400 mascots we are aware of, we now believe over 200 have been killed or are currently imprisoned. Another 90 mascots are missing in action. Many of the missing most likely have done little more than hang up their outfits, a grave error in our judgment, but nonetheless the best case scenario. However, we cannot rule out the possibility that of the 90 missing, some have been killed as well. To the best of our knowledge, between 80 and 100 mascots are here with us tonight, and the most likely scenario with that, within one year from now, Half of us will be captured or dead, and in three years' time, there will be no one. Those who know me will also know that I have fought fearlessly for my entire adult life. But right now, I must admit, I'm afraid. Another silence. I was listening, thinking about everything I had heard, all viewed through the lens of our mentor's sudden reversal. And as I listened, one thing became increasingly clear a gradual reversal of my own, a moment of clarity. What I realized with this, our encounter and complicity with the mascots had been a misunderstanding. They weren't new filmmakers at all. They were actual revolutionaries fighting for their rights, subject to real and constant persecution. We had viewed the entirety of their activities through our own strange screen, assuming they were like us not seeing or admitting the key radical difference. Stop there.